Hi, everyone. So glad to be here. Out of the storms in New York. Nice and warm in Phoenix. And I want to talk to you about engagement. And I, I don't know if you feel this way, but you might feel like we are in a unique and different moment in time around the way that people engage with each other. That something has shifted, maybe imperceptibly, in the way that we pay attention to and engage with the world around us. And if you have the same gut feeling that I do, that we are in the midst of an engagement crisis, increasingly, evidence backs up your feeling. It turns out that in the United States, in the last 30 days, four-fifths of the population has watched filmed entertainment with a second or third screen open in front of them. Second or third screen, can you, can you imagine? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that television was the distraction in and of itself. And now we can't sit through 22 minutes without being like, I'm so bored, what is going on? <laughs> right? And the unfortunate shooting incident of not that long ago in the theater is the sort of front line of this shift in our culture where different cultures are bumping up against each other and crazy people, mostly in the South, are all bumping up against each other <laughs> in this kind of setting where things need to be resolved. Now, engagement is incredibly important for all of us in this room because each one of you has a great idea and each one of you is trying to change the world and each one of you is working deeply and profoundly on the process of this transformation. But if you can't connect your amazing idea for long enough to the minds and hearts of the people that you need to change, the people whose behavior you need to affect, if you cannot get and keep their attention for long enough to get them to change their behavior, then all of our ideas, our collective enthusiasm, our excitement goes nowhere. Now, you may think that that's just hyperbole, but in fact, this is already happening. Let me tell you a little story. Not that long ago, uh, one of the world's largest automakers came to me and said, Gabe, we have a problem. And I said, cool, I like problems. What's your problem? And they said, turns out American teenagers don't want to drive anymore. And I said, wow, that's crazy. That's crazy, right? When I was a teenager, when I was 16, the first thing that I did after failing my driver's license test that first time, the first thing that I did once I got my license was drive and drive all the time. And I said, what is going on? And I said, yeah, it's kind of crazy. Our research says that teenagers don't want to drive because the millennials don't want to harm the environment. They're conscious of the environment, so they don't want to drive if they don't have to. Number two, they don't want to spend their money, so they don't want to drive. But the biggest influence, the real reason why they're not driving is because they have heard our invocation against texting and driving, and so they're choosing to text. <laughs> oh. Actually, by the way, it's Instagram, not texting. And so if you had told me five years ago that Instagram would have killed the car, I would have called you crazy. <laughs> but it's happening. It's happening. In parallel to all of our technological innovation, it's happening. And what it highlights, which is incredibly important for all of us to understand, is that with this next generation, everything is on the table. All the behaviors, no matter how entrenched, no matter how many generations their forebears have done this thing, these things are on the table. People will follow their bliss. They will go wherever the most positive reinforcement and engagement is. And they are willing to upend every aspect of the order in order to make that happen, which is both exciting and potentially frustrating. The reason for this, I posit, is because of games. It is the games that they play, and it is the games that we have been playing collectively for the last three generations which have influenced the design of products large and small that have changed the world around us. And as their influence has grown, they've affected the way the world works. So we now arrive at a moment where if we want to be able to take the immense power of games and level the playing field, if we want to be able to cut through that noise, if we want to be able to transform and change people's behavior, we need to take a page from games and learn how to do that. And that concept is called gamification which in a nutshell is about how we use the power of games and loyalty programs and behavioral economics to change behavior, to engage people and solve problems. It's not, critically, just about throwing some badges up on your crappy website, which is a common misunderstanding about what we're talking about. Many of you have seen gamification examples. You probably think, badges, yes, badges. If I just throw some badges up on the website, people will be like, yay, the environment. Um, but that in and of itself is not enough. Badges are powerful and meaningful, but they're not enough. They need to have meaning in order to be meaningful. I know it's really deep and meta, but it's true. The second thing that gamification is not about is it's not about making everything into a game. I promise you, if you take your poorly thought through idea 
or your poorly thought through training program or educational concept that you would like to convince your fellow colleagues and employees and coworkers and customers about your environmental stewardship and you turn it into a version of fucking Angry Birds, no one will play it. <laughs> I promise you. I promise it is money wasted. Money wasted. So I'm Gabe Zickerman. Uh, I've written three books on the subject of gamification. My latest is called The Gamification Revolution. I run a consultancy called Dopamine. We help all kinds of companies do cool stuff. Uh, I have this conference called G-Summit, which is all about gamification. And at this, in this context, it's important for us to understand what is it even more deeply about games and game-like experiences that makes them interesting. And I want to share with you some examples to help you think about how you might apply this in the thing that you're looking to change. The main thing about gamification or games that are meaningful is what I call the three Fs. And that is feedback, friends, and fun. The more any system has these three things, the more likely someone is to want to do it and do it over and over and over again. Feedback, friends, and fun, all right? So remember these as we look at some of these examples. So my first example, some of you may already be familiar with this one, it's called Speed Camera Lottery. You guys all know about speeding cameras, right? Drive too quickly, they take your picture, there you are behind the wheel, jamming out, take your picture, take your license plate, send you a ticket in the mail. In Scandinavia, in Sweden in particular, the ticket that you get for speeding is not based on how fast you're going at the speeding camera, it's based on how much money you make. So, a few years ago, Sweden handed out a $150,000 ticket to someone for speeding, which I'm sure was like a member of ABBA or uh, president of Ikea or something like that. No offense if Ikea people are here, but wealthy Swedes, that's what we think of. Okay, so set against this backdrop, a guy named Kevin Richardson is asked to reimagine the concept of a speeding camera, and here's how speed camera lottery works. Every time you pass by the speeding camera at or below the limit, you are automatically entered into a lottery to split the proceeds of the people who speed. <laughs> cool, right? Okay, so environmental people, let me ask you a question. It's a loaded question. You can probably already guess the answer to it, but I'm gonna ask you anyway. Rhetorical devices. How, what do you think is a better way to change behavior? Option A, we trust you. You know what the right thing is to do. You know, you know the right thing. You're gonna do the right thing. You're a good employee. You're a good member of society. You're a good steward. You'll do the right thing, and we'll watch you. And if you mess up, ooh, we will make you feel bad. <laughs> or slow, drip-wise, positive social reinforcement for a job well done each and every time, every single time, every single time, and a punishment if you don't comply. Right, B, isn't it obvious? It's B. It's not sky is falling, the world is terrible, You're, you can change things. It's slow, positive reinforcement every time, every single time a person has a decision to make, right? So good. Speed camera lottery lowered speeding by 20 kilometers per hour at the point of intervention in Sweden. It is the most successful behavior change in driving that has ever been done in humanity. In fact, some of you might know that the United States changed the speed limit three times in the last 40 years. It had absolutely no effect on the average speed of the average driver. <laughs> Nothing. Or, that's another example, uh, before we run out of time, from Domino's, to give you a different picture on how you might engage them on the audience with this idea. So, Domino's has this app called Pizza Hero. And in Domino's Pizza Hero, you learn how to make a pizza. You knead the dough, you throw it up like Luigi, you get some sauce, you put it on, you put some cheese, you put some vegetables, you flick your finger, the pizza's baked at your local Domino's and delivered to your house in real life. If you're especially good at making pizza, Domino's will invite you to apply for a job directly from within the game. <laughs> Today, Domino's Pizza Hero is worth a million dollars in incremental revenue per week to the company and has also delivered, apparently, 25,000 resumes for a company that has a big turnover that it needs to fill all the time. Now what's especially interesting about Domino's Pizza Hero, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before, this replaces the inspiring, emotional, uplifting video that explains the craftsmanship of Domino's Pizza. <laughs> or, as an analogy, your environmental stewardship policy. It is a hands-on, tangible, emotional, kinesthetic, physical way of allowing the user to understand your strategy, your methodology, your process. And the millennial generation cares deeply about how things are made. So instead of peeling back the curtain with the music in three minutes, 
You give them something to actually do with their hands, something to do with their brain, something that delivers greater meaning and greater meaningfulness to these users. So, in summary, what I have to tell you, I'm gonna skip over some of these examples. In summary, I will tell you this. This next generation, this millennial consumer, this highly game-oriented player, these kids who grow up with technology in their hands from the time they're two, this millennial generation is absolutely positively aligned with your vision of the world. Either directly because they believe in the things you say or indirectly because they'd rather be Instagramming than burning paper in their backyard, whatever the case may be. But in order to engage them and in order to change the behavior of them and their parents, you might want to tap into the power of games and gamification to make that transformation possible. Thank you. Thank you.